All right, everyone. Welcome to CS235. This is lecture 15. And um, it's been a long, tiring weekend, so we'll, we'll see how coherent this lecture is. I'm hoping some of you enjoyed Maker's Fair. At least one of you. Good. So I had seen these before, but I will uh, show them to you again because I was reminded of them. So this is like the smallest 8020 that you can buy. And um, I don't particularly remember, but I think the smallest Masumi is around this size. And then this is the micro racks. So did anyone see the micro racks stand at Maker Fair? No? Okay. So I think it's micro and then rax.com. And they're really nice guys. And uh, they're coming out with a cheap linear motion to go on the micro racks and they show it to me. It's pretty cool. I mean, for what it is and how cheap it is, it was actually phenomenal. So um, just to give you a quick size comparison, and they do black anodizing. So this is to scale. So you can see they are, in fact, pretty small. So go on their website, check them out, microracks.com. Um, I mean, they don't have nearly the selection of connectors that uh, Masumi and 8020 do. And you also don't have the benefit of a gigantic corporation, you know, behind it in terms of lead times. But if you need small stuff, it's pretty cool. So uh, today we're going to talk about springs, in stops, and towards the end, because it's a more diffuse topic, uh, the final project. We'll talk more about the final project on Wednesday as well. Hopefully tonight or tomorrow, sometime, I'll send out the official final specifications for the final project. The one thing you need to know is time is of the essence. We don't have a whole lot of time left. So um, if you don't want to get screwed by the final project, you probably want to start after class. Let's talk about um, uh, after class today. <laughs> Um, so, were there any questions from last time before I get started? Mainly I'm just stalling because I, I forgot to pull up some CAD, so, okay, well, I'll stall on that. Um, ba -bum -bum -bum. Hey, it came up quickly, cool. And then this, so I did forget one thing from the last talk. <clears throat> So going back, this is just my CAD for my robot table. Uh, I forgot to mention two important things. One is assemblability. Just because you can design something in CAD does not mean you can put it together with your two hands or in the case of this table, the six hands of me and my wife and friend. Um, if we look at these corners here, what you really want to do, and I'm really not joking, you want to get a hold of CAD of a human hand holding a wrench and put it in here for big projects and see if you can actually fit the hand in the wrench. Because what I discovered was I could barely assemble this damn thing because I have huge hands and these little corners, the way I design it here, let's, let me hide this. So you see these corners here? And they're like, eight bolts, there was barely any room to put the, uh, the Allen key and there was even less room for my hand. And actually there was an order of operations problem because if you look at these screw heads, you can see that these screws didn't want to go in because the heads wanted to collide with each other. So I had to wiggle them and there was an order of operations thing where I could only put in certain screws first and then put in the other screws last. So um, if you're doing simple 8020 stuff, it's, it's a no-brainer. You don't really have to plan it out that much. But uh, as the 8020 uh, frames get more and more complicated, if you don't plan out stuff like where to put your hand, you will get screwed. I got very lucky. And remember, the worst type of error is the type that doesn't bite you because you never learn from it. So, um, you know, it's not just me. I don't particularly like the big engineering firms because I think they're dumb, but uh, places like uh, Lockheed Martin, if they're doing some type of engine or GE, they actually have CAD with a dude with a wrench to make sure that they can actually fit their arms in to service it. And that, that actually is really important because otherwise it won't be built. All right, so the other thing I want to note is you see this MDF here? 
What does that remind you of that I showed you last week? The optical table. The optical table. So uh, optical tables are pretty expensive and heavy. And I chose to make the expensive and heavy part the 8020 and not the optical table. So what you can do is you can laser cut yourself your own optical table. And then this is really great for thing bolting down electronics. Um, because it's kind of hard to know until the robot's actually built like where all the electronics go. But if you make an optical breadboard out of MDF, then you can just kind of move it around as you want. Um, anyone know why I'm bolting? These are, these are little uh, Maxon amps and these are little power supplies. Anyone know why I'm doing this? The huh? The uh, well, yes, I want to keep them. Why, why does it matter if my electronics are bolted down or not? Cabling? Uh, cabling, but yeah, I mean, I could cable it however. Anything else? They might, fall off. they might fall off because I'm going to be moving it somewhere or someone's going to shake my table or I'm going to spill my Coke and start pushing things around quickly. Electronics are not happy unless they're bolted down. That's why most of the little PCBs you order off of SparkFun have four little holes in them for mounting them. I want, in all the final projects, every single piece of electronics has to be zip-tied or bolted to something rigidly. Because otherwise, someone's going to drop their final project and the fidgets are going to go flying and rip all the wires out. And I've seen more projects than not ruined because the electronics weren't bolted down. Um, so I would recommend if you know you want some electronics in the general area but you don't know how you're going to put them, to laser cut yourself a grid of holes. And then um, what we can do, let me show you this little sub-assembly. I know this is all kind of simple dumb stuff and you're like, seriously, I'm a, ma you know, a master's or PhD student at Stanford and you're telling me about bolting electronics, but this is the difference between things working and not. <coughs> Has anyone ever seen those little little power supplies, the little switching power supplies that look, kind of look like Swiss cheese? They're in a silver box with lots of holes. Well, they, they exist. So um, this here, note, when I catted it, this doesn't look particularly nice, right? Like it doesn't actually look like the real thing. And here, let me show you what I mean. Uh, They're going to take forever, aren't they? So Meanwell makes a lot of these. So let's try, see these? I know they're kind of small. Basically, it's just a sheet metal box with some terminals on it. And um, can everyone sort of see what this looks like? If you want to zoom in, you can press control and scroll. Control and scroll? Ooh, hey. You know how to use a computer. I do not. Okay, so it's basically this. It's a box with lots of holes for uh, getting air out to take away the heat. Now, I am not such a stickler for CAD that you have to CAD the holes and the Meanwell sticker. So the obvious parts of this CAD are the overall box dimensions. Maybe, if it's particularly complicated and space is tight, where the terminals are. And the bolt pattern. So as you see here, this, these are the overall dimensions. I just labeled it so I know what it is. This is the terminal block. I didn't put every screw. I just put this is the overall geometry so that I know if I'm putting it upside down or backwards. And then finally, what are these? Those are the bolt holes. <coughs> so the bolt holes don't fit your optical table, right? These are some random screw size, some random spacing. And you don't want random sizes for an optical breadboard. You want something nice, like a round number, like, I don't know, 50 millimeters, and maybe these will be M6 threads or something. And the odds are this will be completely different from all of your electronics. So, so the solution is to use an adapter plate. So this is whatever the bolt pattern is for my electronics. And then this is a plate that does have the standard spacing of my uh, optical breadboard and it's a pain and you're like hey I shouldn't have to do this but it will save you so much time just take my word on it having not done this repeatedly and always regretted it does anyone know what these things are right here so, yeah so for MDF and plywood 
Um, you can tap them maybe once, but if you ever take the screw out, it's done. You're not going to re-tap it, especially MDF. And so, uh, you know, if it was an aluminum or steel breadboard, then you could tap it and be done. But for MDF, you need something better. So this is called a, I think it's called a T-nut insert. T-nut insert, and they sell them on McMaster. And so what happens is, if this is your plate, and this is your laser cut hole, if you were to thread into this, it may work, it may not work. It definitely won't work more than once. So what you do is you get this little plug and you hammer it in and it's got these little spiked barbs in it that resist torque and also keep it from coming out and then you thread directly into this. So you don't thread into the MDF, you thread into the little T-nut inserts. Yeah? Well, they have uh, nut inserts that actually have like, threads on them already and then actually hammered in. So what I did was I went on McMaster and I ordered every type of insert for hammering into wood and I tried them all and this was the only type I liked. They do. Wait, this one does not have threads? This does have threads. So on, 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 let me open it up. So in here it's threaded and then this is the part that hammers into the plate and there's a flange here to locate it against the back surface of the plate and then these little barbs are what keep it from falling out so it resists being pulled out and also it resists um, twisting. So which direction should I put my screw on? This side or this side? If I have a choice. So like this? Why? Exactly. This is not obvious to everyone or maybe some people are just especially dumb. But I've seen people do it the other way repeatedly and then be like, why is it coming out? <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Doesn't that mean if you have a particularly heavy object on top, it might just push it out? Might just push it out. If you happen to drop your table or if there's a shock and you're moving it somewhere, it might just fall out down. Um, there's a possibility. These, these barbs are pretty good. I mean, I don't have a good answer for them except buy some and hammer them in. I've never had one fall out ever. If you have dropped your robot with such a force that these come out, then your robot no longer exists, most likely. So anyway, these are called T-nut inserts. Everybody might want to write that down and look for them on McMaster later. Or you can look for wood inserts. Just search until the part looks like this. And you'll see like 20 other designs. I've tried them all. I really don't like them. Okay, so you take your random electronic on the back side, you put the uh, hole pattern for the electronics. Then you have one, two, three, four, or however many you like, um, bolts for your standard breadboard pattern. And then, hopefully, if I did this right, let's open this up. Okay, so see all these little guys? These are all my little T inserts. And then um, you can see my 80-20 nuts here. Okay, now let's notice something. Most electronics, don't, they don't give you the CAD, right? Like you buy some random power supply, they're not going to give you the CAD. So you either read the drawing and make it, or you measure it with calipers. For really nice high-end stuff, like Copley amps and National Instrument stuff, whoop, that's wrong, they'll actually, um, give you the nice CAD, and that's particularly good. So you can see, this is a Copley amp, so it gives me the bolt patterns. That's actually really nice. So if you're buying things that are a couple hundred dollars, ask for the CAD, and if not, get out your calipers. And then the reason why you put this in CAD is because it helps you plan for where things are gonna go and how you're gonna wire them. So in my case, like for encoder wires, you want to minimize, and sensor wires, you want to minimize the distance the wires have to go, right? Because it's a giant antenna and you're going to get noise on your line. And if you put all of your electronics in CAD and you know where your motors are, then you can try to minimize that distance. And it, it makes a big difference, like the difference between it working and not working. So um, all of you, I would like CAD of your electronics. It doesn't have to be beautiful. It could be little square boxes, but do you want CAD of electronics in your final project? and I want them bolted rigidly. This is my computer. And see I've got, I even have, these, these are little MDF things that swing down 
and then I have a little piece of foam here that my computer rests on and also insulates from the 8020 electrical connection. So these are all little details that go into making the overall robot work. And I, I made sure I went around the lab and measured like 10 different computers and took the mean of them to make sure that I could fit like another computer if I upgraded to a different frame. Anyway, so that's, uh, that's electronics in your 8020 or in your CAD. So, let's get on with springs. I know you've all been waiting all quarter for them because I've been promising them all freaking quarter. So, let's start with what some of the common springs are. Somebody name some springs. Okay, that's good. So mo most springs are linear springs that obey Hooke's law, which is try not to get eaten by alligators. And um, so that's F equals KX. So give me some linear springs. Tension springs. Tension springs. Bob, could you please zoom in on the screen and then come camera me? Yes, I used camera as a verb. Okay, so tension springs, what else? Compression. Compression springs, good. Keep going. Torsion springs, good. What else? Tell me something you've been using in your labs repeatedly. Belleville washers, those are springs. Okay, how about some non-traditional springs? Well, we can abstract this. We don't have to just start out with a specific type of spring. Um, let's think about materials. So ma for materials, we have tensile strength and compressive strength and torsional sp strength and flexural strength. So we could use any one of those and get a chunk of material and it's a spring. So this is a tensile spring and now it's a compressive spring and now it's a torsional spring. Tensile spring, compressive spring, torsional spring, flexural spring. So you can take any chunk of material and depending on how you yank it, now it's that type of spring. And the reason I'm saying this is because if you are designing things and they don't have a spring that fits your needs, perhaps what you actually want is a chunk of material and you'll be using it as a, a pure material spring. So um, we'll get back to this. Someone remind me about torsion springs and chunks of material. Okay, so can you camera this? So this is a tensile spring or an extension spring because you extend it. Okay, this is pretty common and it's linear. And then this is a compressive spring. It starts out wanting to be compressed and I squish it and it gets smaller. Okay. This is a torsion spring. So it's got these two prongs. And what I do is I I rotate them. Can anyone see that? Okay. See that? Okay. Torsion. This is called a torsion spring. So, what's the difference between a torsion spring and the extension and compression springs I just showed you? It's linear versus rotary. So these ones I pull on in a linear motion and these ones I twist in a rotary motion. So um, the thing about springs you always got to worry about is what happens if whatever's attached to them snaps back. So these, does anyone know what happens when these snap? You have a ragged edge that's going to go crazy and try to swipe you. And for those who are her suit like myself. That. That really freaking hurts. <laughs> so I've pinched the willy out of myself with uh, extension springs repeatedly. They grab hair like it's their job. 
These are the most dangerous. I hate these. I refuse to use these based on the fact that I value my fingers. So these little things, these barbs, snap back really easily. And I've never really seen them used in a way that doesn't make me extremely nervous. Uh, I mean, you can use them just fine, but they do make me extremely nervous. So, and I wish I could tell you more about these, but there's nothing more to say. They're Hooke's Law, F, F equals KX. You can replace F with tau and X with theta for a torsion spring. They come in many different shapes and sizes. Here's our smorgasbord. So they come as tiny as um, you kind of have to get a microscope to look at it. Or they come giant honking. I didn't bring them up here, but the ones in the PR1 were like massive. And those you had to design for what happens if the spring lets go and explodes because they can hold a lot of energy. Um, these, anyone recognize these? What are these called? Conical springs. You know where you find these a lot? Batteries. Batteries. Do you guys know where to order springs from? Lee Spring. If you need a spring, they have it. And they have nice CAD of it too. Don't CAD your own springs. You have to get the CAD for your springs. Okay? The reason being, if you have a spring like this, how are you going to design around this? What's with the ends? They're not flat. And they, if it's an extension spring, they have something like this that you, uh, you yank on here. So maybe I'll crimp a cable here and I'll crimp a cable there. And I need to know what the internal diameter of this loop is. And then I need to know, um, you know, so I can see if my cable can fit in or if I can crimp to it. Uh, this is just like... Some of you discovered I put a little Easter egg in you in the CAD for Lab 3 for y'all where there's a screw that collided with your mechanism and some of you got it, some of you didn't. This is even worse. You really, it really matters what the ends of your springs look like. So always get, get them from Lee Spring and then always get the CAD for them. And Lee Spring is really good about that. Most spring companies you can't find the CAD for. Okay, so those are the main ones. Um, so tension, compression, and torsion. Most of the time that's what you see and yeah. How do you mount springs? Exactly. So if it's tension, you're gonna put some type of cable and just pull on it. So every, let, me, let me actually draw out, actually, here. Can you zoom in on this? Okay, everyone see this? So I can pull on this Basically, my fingers are whatever you want them to be. So they could be rods, they could be cables. The key is I have to see how it's not closed. I could slip a cable past that. So a common way is to slip a cable on and then crimp it in place. But what do you think is the danger of doing that? It's a really small bend radius. If I crimp a cable directly around this end, it's a really small bend radius and there's the odds are at some point I'm going to fatigue the cable and break it if, if I'm ever changing the loading on it. So what do you think we could do? Anybody? Yeah. So we give ourselves something bigger to crimp onto. So say that this is our cable loop that comes for the spring. Now if I were to crimp the cable directly to it, okay, I'd be at this radius. And that's really tiny and that would fatigue my cable. So instead what I can do is I could say laser cut something like this. This is a plate and then I crimp my cable around the entire thing. So I'm crimping on a much bigger diameter. Does anyone see how that works? Maybe not. Maybe I should have drawn it over previous drawing. So how does the plate come off there? It doesn't. You, um, you can put little stoppers on it. Here, let me draw it nicer. Unfortunately, mounting springs isn't as clean as like mounting and tensioning cables. Okay. 
So this is that. And now I'm going to put a plate. And I'm just going to color it in. So this is a circular plate. I've just kind of, what you do is you take pliers and you bend this down long enough to smush the plate on. And then imagine that if we look at it this way, imagine this is what the plate looked like. Okay? And maybe I put little rubber stoppers here to keep it from walking off the spring. And then I can put my cable, I can crimp, my, my cable comes in here, and then I can crimp all the way around. And that's my crimp. So now I'm a much larger diameter, so I'm not going to fatigue it as easily. You don't. So how could I make an approximation of this with the laser cutter? Three plates. Three plates. So then I could do one, two, three, and what do I want in here? Dowels. Want some dowels and what else? Screws. I want some screws. Yeah. And then I would crimp like that. Let's talk about some, are there any other questions about how to mount a spring? Can you use one of those springs as a torsional spring? As a torsional spring. I don't know. I wouldn't recommend it. What about compressive springs? Like, do you have to make... Uh, compressive springs. By the way, you should know I, I haven't necessarily built all of these in every question you've asked, so I'm kind of winging it with some of this. Um, I think I mounted a compressive spring once by basically I made like a cylinder, and then I put the spring down in it, like that. So it kind of kept the end right here, and then I did the same on the top, and then I moved it up and down. But you'll, depending on how you're doing it, you might, you probably want a rod down the center of this that doesn't actually touch the spring, but in the event of something becoming misaligned or something exploding, it'll keep the spring from flying off and taking out an eye. And this could even be a steel cable. Basically, you want a backup that keeps the spring from actually getting out of your mechanism. Does everyone see what I'm talking about? Putting the rod in the middle? Okay, torsion springs I really hate, as I said. And typically what people will do, I don't recommend this, but... So here's the coil, and then they put that, right? So typically what they'll do is this trick where they laser cut something for it to sit in, and then they'll like put a screw on this barb and a screw on this barb on the other thing that's moving. It makes me really, and, and maybe they'll put a core in it, and then they'll put something on the outside to constrain it top and bottom, so it's just like the middle threads, the middle uh, curves or uh, sections of the helix that are actually working. I, it just makes me nervous. I've never seen it done well. So the way that I like to do torsion springs is, you know those flexible shaft couplers I showed you to connect to motors? Everybody remember this? They sell plastic ones. And they're pretty linear. Um, and they're comparable to the type of springs you'd want to be buying for these type of applications. So I actually like to buy a plastic shaft coupler from uh, Stock Drive. Have I talked about Stock Drive before? It's called sdp-si.com. They're extremely unfriendly to deal with. They're in New York. They've hung up on me repeatedly. Uh, always check their, always call them because their they're like online in stock system doesn't work at all. So you'll be like, oh, they have 100 belts left. Great. And then you call them and they're like, yeah, we're completely out of stock and it takes eight weeks. So when you order from Stock Drive, you want to actually call them and get them on the phone. The downside is then you have to deal with them and they're really grouchy. <laughs> Because they they're the, the only distributor of a lot of stuff. A lot of really hard to find mechanical stuff, that's them. They don't, no one else has it. What they do is they find tiny little companies and then they become the sole distributor of their product. And they, they refuse to tell you who actually manufactures it. So you call them up and you're like, hey, I like these flex pivots. And they're like, cool, they're out of stock. And you're like, oh, okay. Hmm. Well, uh, do you make them? No. Oh, well, can I call the company to see when they'll have them available? No, I can't tell you who the company is. Oh, I see. So what you do is then you take their product and you search the general term online until you find like the only company in the world that makes it, and that's them. 
So you, you oftentimes, and you can also try to trick the telephone operator, like some type of sob story about your aunt and a dog and needing this special torsion spring. And I've tri I've tricked them on occasion into divulging their their secret supply. Yes. Yeah. Also, it helps if you pretend to be like a lost undergrad and it's your first year in this big Stanford campus and I really need to know who makes this flex pivot. It's worked. <laughs> that worked? Not that one. I don't remember how I actually got them. I think I got someone who was particularly tired of their job and didn't care if they got fired. McMaster's the same way. Like, only 10% of the time have I gotten them to tell me who sells their, their products. Anyway. Um, so yeah, just having, uh, remember how I talked, the other way you can make a torsion spring other than the flexible shaft coupled out of plastic is to just take a chunk of something and twist it. And so if it's like aluminum, that's going to be really stiff, but if you take like um, a bar of rubber, then that's actually pretty good. What do you think would be the downside of using a bar of rubber for a spring? Non-linear. There you go, non-linear. So we were talking about linear springs, but there are, there are more nonlinear springs than there are linear springs. But they're also really helpful. So let's talk about that for a second. Can I, can I, also, like, mm. I can't understand what type of spring on this one. Okay, okay, so we don't want to do. Why would you have it? Why would you want to do it anyway? Why would you want to do what, it? What does it do? What does it do? Okay, so say you have two plates. Yes. And uh, say you have two plates and you and you, you want to be able to spin them and have a torsional restoring force between them. So you might use a torsional spring. And so let me try to draw it in 3D. So we'll take one plate and a second plate, okay? And now let, let's say I put little mounts in it like this. What are the dash lines for? A hole, okay? And now say this is my torsion spring and then I'll put a screw here, and then I'll put the other. I'll put the other here with a screw here. So now, when I twist the two plates, they want to go back. Um, and typically, people will screw down. I don't even remember what they're called. The little barbs here. So how would you do it with your plastic thing? With my plastic thing. Um, it, it, with the plastic thing. So it'll just be a cylinder, and it has, uh, remember the lab one, the shaft collars? It'll have clamps, so you take a shaft and ground it on this plate and ground it on that plate, and then this in between is able to, to rotate. So just two shafts and then you clamp it in and you're done. It's just this spiral thing that, that you use. It's the helical shaft coupler. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you can see this, all you need is a set of Allen keys, and you just twist it, and you're done. But isn't that technically a spring? Yeah. A shaft yeah, it's exactly a spring. So this is not an example of you using non-linear springs? Some uh, Keith's question wasn't about what we were talking oh, about. Okay. Yeah, it was the previous thing. I didn't understand what yeah. you said. You said that was bad, and I didn't really Yeah. Oh, okay. So, sorry, let's back up. Maybe not everyone heard Keith's question. Keith's question was, I don't understand that. Uh, how's it work? And my answer was, uh, this is a linear spring. All we want is a linear torsional spring. This is the bad way that people do that cuts their hands off. And then this is using a flexible shaft coupler, which is a linear spring. And all you have to do is clamp it in place. Does everyone understand how this works? OK, so what we could do instead, and this is part of the reason I'd like you to not pigeonhole um, mechanical widgets into only doing the thing they're meant to do. That doesn't mean take a hammer and use it as a screwdriver. Please don't do that. What it means is don't be close-minded about the way that mechanical components can be used. So this, you know, is meant for transmitting tor uh, torques, but I could also use the spring rate of it to be a torsional spring. Let's say I just uh, somehow gripped a rod of rubber Just a solid rod of rubber. Okay. Now, how is this any different from any of these other things? When I twist the plates, there's a restoring torque. The only difference is is the force deflection curve 
isn't a straight line, you know, it might be something else, something nonlinear. And, you know, the stuff with nonlinear is it's fine to use it as long as you know what the force deflection curve is and you know that you can control for it and it'll, it'll meet your application needs. Uh huh. Could you give a quick example of when you would do, want to do something like this, have them have a restoring force? Have a restoring force. Okay. Um, let me think about that for a sec. Well, let's say, <clears throat> sure, we'll talk about this later anyway. Um, people, one of the reasons people like to use springs is uh, safety. And so if you have a robot arm moving around and everything is very rigidly coupled and it runs into something, then the chances are that you're going to have pretty high forces um, hitting whatever it is it's contacting with. And so people will put springs in line with the transmission to try to um, lower the impact force because you've got the robot arm's momentum and we're going to decelerate the robot arm into someone's head and then or table and so we're going to have a, a force impulse, right? And so the spring will help bring down that force. Uh-huh. Well then, in that particular application, what's the trade-off between using that or a like a back travel motor that if it hits something, it'll just kind of go back? Uh, that goes pretty deep. I'm not prepared to really trowel those depths. Um, but you know who is? Dan Walker. He, that's what his dissertation is on in some respects. Um, yeah, my personal opinion is robots aren't safe, period. So if you don't want to get hurt, don't get near them. Like if you're in its strike zone, you're not safe. Or if you're able to lick your fingers and touch the optical breadboard that it's bolted to, the odds are someone hot-wired it so you're going to get electrocuted. So. Um, robots next to people, I think, is an inherently unsafe. So I, you know, I'd just be cautious around them. And there's a lot of research that goes into making them safe. And I'm, I'm not, from my point of view, I just put on a helmet and feel safe. Uh, so yeah, in uh, inline compliance for safety. Also, when when you're assembling things, um, the Scara robot. Anyone know what a Scara robot is? Yeah, it's the one that's planar and then has a linear, and it's for pick and place a lot. It actually started out, they wanted some, some in-plane compliance for inserting pegs into holes. So sometimes you want rigidity, like in the axis when you're stuffing the peg into the hole, but then in terms of aligning the, the sh shaft with the hole, you want for it to be able to kind of get started and then kind of auto-center. So you want some, some compliance. So compliance is a really uh, key thing. Actually, you, you sort of skipped me ahead a few paragraphs, but that's fine. Let's go... Okay, say you only have steppers. Or I guess I have an electron steppers. Let's say you only have servos. And actually, Rob, can you please head back over? Say you only have servos, So you, uh, and these are not nice Dynamixel ones that can also do force control. Say you have crappy um, RC servos. And so you only have position control. But you'd really like to do force control. So what's the answer? A spring. So, um, if this is the end of my robot, and then I put a spring, and the only thing I can control is um, you know moving my motor. I'm not applying torques. I'm just p applying positions. But if I butt up against you know a wall and I want to apply one newton that way, I can push until um, I can push, uh, and then knowing Hooke's law, I can back out what the force, like what the uh, position should be, the deflection based on the stiffness of my spring to get a, a given force. So one of the reasons people use springs in robots is if they want to do force control, force control at the end effector with position controlled motors. Everyone understand that? Because remember we could do tau equals kti and we could just apply the right current to get the right torque. That's only if we are set up using the right motors and the right amps. If instead we have really cheap motors or motors that aren't even, they're not even uh, able to do force control, so like a stepper, 
then we have to do position control, and then we have to put some type of compliance, and then sense, sense the deflection to back out the force. Mm -hmm. If you have to use four sensors, um, well, that's sort of a different topic, but uh, let's save that one. That also is a, is a bit of a deep hole. Well, um, okay, sure, we can talk about that. Okay, so how are we going to sense this deflection? Some type of encoder. So let's say I give you one of the US digital incremental ones and it's linear. All right, so this is our little read head. So it's just it's it's an optical encoder, but it's linear instead of rotary. Okay? And so as we compress, I see my little ticks fly by and that gives me the deflection. Okay. For a given resolution, do you want a stiffer spring or a floppier spring? Floppier is more precise. Floppier is more precise. Because for a given force range, I want more encoder ticks to be flying by so that I can count them off. If I had, you know, it's so stiff that all of the compression of my spring is, you know, takes place between two encoder ticks, I'll never see it. I can't control for it. Okay? So if you're using a, an inline spring and you have, say, you use US Digital. So US Digital's max encoder is 2500 CPR. And yes, I know that's for a rotary encoder and we're discussing linear, but just bear with me. For a given manufacturer that you like, they have some maximum CPR for their encoder. And so if you want to get higher resolution in terms of your force control, you need a floppier spring. What happens when you have a floppier spring? You get some weird dynamics. So we take our robot arm and then we put springs on it, and then the floppier it gets, the lower the resonant frequency. And the lower the resonant frequency, the lower the bandwidth that we can actually operate at, right? So, you know, if we have a, if this is a second order mass spring damper, we have some resonance on a Bode plot, so we are limited to over here in terms of the frequency domain. And so the floppier and floppier you get, the lower that frequency is. And so um, in one of the robot arms I built, I don't know if, I think I told you about it, I had a flex coupler that went to the, the roll and the roll pitch roll wrist. And uh, after the tortuous path, it was, it was like going, 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 going. And so we could never hope to operate any faster than that resonant frequency. The other thing you get is you get just nasty deflections from gravity, but you can compensate for those a, a bit. Okay, so what happens if you have a nonlinear spring? You can control for it, but you need to know what that force deflection curve is. And so if, if you don't, if you order, uh, if you have something that, you know, there are equations for, like a magnet, then great. If you just have a chunk of material and you're not quite sure what it is and you can't get it from the manufacturer, you have to characterize it, right? So you're going to stretch it or twist it and measure the torque and the force versus the position, and then you're going to build your own, you're going to build your own curve. And as long as you know it's uh, monotonic, you're going to be fine. Okay, let's talk about another thing. Um, has anyone ever heard of stiffening springs? So these are springs that if you do something to them, it changes their stiffness. So the springs we've been talking about, the stiffness is the same regardless of what you do to them. You apply more force and they're just as stiff. You apply less force and they're just as stiff. So what I'm talking about is a spring that the harder you push, the higher the stiffness is. Right? So something like this. As my forces get higher, my stiffness is getting higher, right? Yeah. Um, no, a dash pot is, I think a dash pot is um, a damper, and that is with respect to velocity. Someone feel free to correct me, but... I, I mean, I, I know that's true, but, like, is the effect kind of the same? Not sure. So this is just a nonlinear spring, but the nonlinearity is, is simple? 
uh, in this case, the nonlinearity is such that the harder we push, the stiffer it gets. So let's think about how we could use this. Say we have a robot arm and we put inline compliance because we want it to be somewhat safer. Okay? And, and the somewhat safer is because rather than smushing your head, we're smushing the spring in our robot arm. So we have more time to decelerate the robot and so that impulse, the, the force is lower. Okay? And so say that sometimes we want to be in safe mode where it's real floppy and we don't smush anybody. But now maybe we have overnight shift mode where everyone's gone home and we don't have to worry about safety and we just want picking and placing really quickly. But we want the same robot mechanism. So what we're going to use is we're going to use stiffening springs. So say this is my end effector and I'm going to do a cable transmission here. And these are my springs. Okay. And I'm going to put motor one and motor two. Okay, this is, this is a cable system. Is this a closed loop cable system? No, it's not. I have two motors. Um, I have two motors. It's not a closed loop cable system. Jesus Christ, that thing's annoying. Okay. So I have two motors spinning this. So in math, what's the, what's the uh, potential thing I could do here for stiffening spring? What do you mean tighten? You're right, but what do you mean? You make one of them longer and the other one shorter. Then mm, the not quite. Is there any way that I can um, keep this from moving, but I can still spin the motors? So say if this is a point here, I move them both here like this. It's a null space, a non-trivial null space. So my arm is not moving, but I'm still taking up cable slack and I'm stretching these springs. So the springs are getting tighter and tighter and tighter. And then if I have a stiffening spring, so the force is going up, 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 they're getting stiffer. Okay? So I can take the same robot arm with the same springs and if I don't take up cable, it's floppy. And then if I start stretching the cables backwards in the null space, it's not affecting the motion of the robot arm at the output, but my arm is getting stiffer. So I could, you could literally see, just by playing with the null space, you could either have an arm that's really floppy, or you could just start stretching the internal um, tension, and now it's you know, super stiff and, and has higher bandwidth. And this, I'm not making this up. This is stuff that people actually do. No one accused me, but anyway. Okay, so let me show you some other springs that are interesting. This is one of my favorites. I've shown this to you before, so hopefully someone remembers the name. Anyone remember what this is? It's a pot spring, or uh, sorry, a pot string, a potentiometer string, or it could be uh, called a uh, string spring. There are like 20 different names for this. I have them written down somewhere. Uh, so what this is, is um, a string and it goes to some type of torsion spring in here. Now there are different types of torsion springs. I, we talked about the linear type, but there are also nonlinear types. Rob, can you please zoom in on this? Has anyone ever heard of a constant force spring? Okay. No? Okay, so I'm going to tell you what it is, and then I want you to tell me what the deflection curve looks like, force deflection curve. So constant. No matter how much you pull on it, it's the same force. A flat line. All right. Okay. So this was our linear one, and this was our stiffening spring, and this is our constant force spring. As long as in, in here, let me give you a little. It's actually like that. A constant force spring is weird at zero, and it's weird at the end. But in the middle, it's almost perfectly flat. So you can stretch it back and forth, and it doesn't change the force. And so this is really. Huh? In the end, it's too infinite because it just stops. Yeah. Well, in the end, actually, it will be. 
somewhat linear because you're starting to stretch the cable. Oh. So as you reach the end, you're no longer pulling on the string, you're pulling against some shear rod internally and so it's, it's linear or you're pulling on the cable itself. So you're deforming it? Yeah, uh, no, well, elastically. Oh. Uh, okay, so imagine right now I hit the end, okay? And there's a crimp on the back of it and it doesn't let me pull out anymore. Now I'm stretching the cable and now that's linear. A hint, if you ever do that to these, they're dead. Don't do that. This is a thought experiment you should not repeat in real life. You know what else is bad? Doing this. Ow. Okay, beyond that hurting. Um, is this what's in all the things? Yep. Yep. So um, this is bad. Anyone know why? I'm probably going to break it by the end of the lecture. It's okay. Anyone know why this is terrible? Where do you think the cable's going? Oh, ho, ho. Yeah, we're dead. That's why. Does it get off the track? Gets off the track. This is ruined. <laughs> I ruined it for you. This is like I always say, I don't want conflict diamonds. I want to say, baby, I destroyed a village for you. <laughs> I'm joking. Don't fire me. I was in the vacuum cleaner, uh, European side. <laughs> then you press a button and it I don't know how they work. You're right. Maybe they have like a this is a cheaper version. These are, if anyone has ID bags, you can play with them. This is not constant force. This is a. This almost never gets off track. Uh, yes. Because then, yeah, true. This is actually different. This is not a constant force spring. This is a torsion spring. And it's a very different torsion spring. I don't even know what it's called. That You see these a lot in watches. Um, but they're pretty rare in terms of us using them in robotics. I mean, they're very common in that all of you are wearing a watch, but um, they're very rare in terms of actually using it in a robot. This is different, and I don't know if it's linear or not, but feel free to take it apart and play with it. Uh, so before I broke this, this was really nice, and inside of it there is a constant force spring, and I mean, it's, it's an excellent thing to show you. It's off the track. So what happens with, with string pots is if you yank them back in an uncontrolled fashion, the cable comes off of its capstan and gets wound around something and then breaks. So let me show you what a constant force spring looks like naked. And shit. Rob, if you can uh, zoom in for a sec. Okay, there's a chance there's gonna be... Ow! It's my foot. It hurt. The mic. It's over. Okay, do you still have audio? Okay. Well, it's a good lesson because these will cut your hand off. Actually, hey, Rob. Rob helped me install this thing. Uh, Rob helped me install these way back when, and they are ridiculously unsafe. So please don't use them unless. Making me really freaking nervous. We'll try. Are these just sheets of metal? These are just sheets of metal. These are really big honking constant force springs. Okay. Let's see if I can. Jesus. Okay. It's not quite counterbalanced enough. By the way, this is like 22 pounds. So it's pretty. Can you everyone see how it's basically balanced? I'm applying almost no force with my thumbs. So what a constant force spring is just a, a coil of flat metal. I can't really hold this up anymore. It's fucking heavy. Can you see? Bob, can you see that at all? Okay. Okay. So someone tell me something obvious. It's heavy. It's heavy. <laughs> Thank you. Someone tell me something obvious and useful. There are two sheets now. Uh, they don't have to be. Curves. It's nasty. Okay? It's not that big a deal, so I'm going to do this. Can everyone see how the metal kind of sways back and forth? What it wants to do, and I'm going to take the weights off for a sec. Okay. Two things. One is installing this is, is terrible. Rob and I wore like thick leather gloves and face shields. This curve is terrible. This twist is even worse. Okay? So constant force springs are not things that you want to play with unless you really know what you're doing because they're razor sharp, they snap back, 
they're hard to install. And what I wanted to show you with this twist, um, can everyone, Rob, can you zoom in? Can you see how this is not in a line? The coils are kind of weaving back and forth. They're not easily controlled in terms of their geometry. They kind of go wherever they want. And these are sharp, so these will start eating into your flanges. They'll start eating into the other, the other springs on here. And they're not, um, see that? They're not flat. So there are tricks for them. I have used these quite a bit now. What you want to do, can anyone give me an idea for how I might uh, get that thing to behave a little better? What do you think? Okay, well, I'll put some flanges onto it. I'm either going to eat the spring or eat the flange, and either way, what happens if I eat the flange? Where's the, where do the particles from the flange go? Everywhere. Okay. So this is what I would like. I would like a spring that comes off at a perfect tangent. And this is what I actually get. I get something that comes off and then actually, just because I can, will show it's twisting out of the board too. So this is not straight. And then this twists. And it walks back and forth in and out of the board. So what I like to do is I put a prismatic joint here. Okay. And then I tie the end of the spring to it rigidly. So now it has to go in a straight line back and forth. So that really decreases this curviness. And also, if I do this right, it gets rid of the twist. But still, if you have this section of uh, unsupported length, it's a giant guitar, so you're going to hear the entire time. Uh, and then I like to put a giant metal box around all this, so if anything snaps, it doesn't. no one loses an eye. But this, this trick of putting a prismatic joint on it really helps. So I have one of these in my robot, and it has a massive um, linear guide on it. And it gets rid of the twist, and it gets rid of the not quite straight. Now the only thing you have to remember is it's linear over what? The middle of the workspace. So if this is the circle, the diameter, I think the manufacturer I got said you have to get out 1.5 times the diameter coil before it starts being a constant force. Then after that you're very constant. But when the when the basically in this region right here, if I were to start pulling pulling on this right here, it's very not constant. Anyone know why I have two instead of one? It's obvious. Uh, no, I can get rid of that with a linear guide either way. Why? Why do I want to distribute the load? Is it just because you don't want to have one really big one? So you... There are two reasons, and you got one of them. So fatigue life on these is huge. Depending on uh, the, what you get, I got these off McMaster. You get down to like 5,000 cycles on some of these. If for the real extreme ones, I think these ones are 25,000. That's not very many cycles for a spring. Okay, so one of the things you can do is sort of the, the bigger and beefier they are, the worse the fatigue life. So if you need to counterbalance 20 pounds, and they have a 10 pound and a 20 pound one, and the 20 pound only li uh, lives for 5,000 cycles, but the 10 pound lives for 25,000 cycles, then you get two 10 pounds. It's the same counterbalancing force, but five times the cycle life. The other reason is, at some point, because of this very finite uh, fatigue life, it's going to fracture and snap. And when it does, I would like a graceful failure rather than a just, oh crap, all of my spring broke. So the chances of them both breaking at exactly the same time are pretty small. And I would design my system so that if one of them broke, it could limp along safely until I shut down the robot. And so uh, actually in the DaVinci robot, they have, they've nested these, not side by side, but actually one inside the other. And they have like five or six of them. And so if one of them breaks, they can still shut down the robot safely. So 
You can use multiple springs basically to increase the, the ultimate safety if one of them breaks. There's not a single point failure. And then also when you use more smaller springs, you increase the fatigue life quite a bit. Okay, magnets are excellent springs. They're very power, uh, uh, power dense in that to get the same uh, deflection, you know, the same stiffness out of a, a metal spring would actually be quite large. Um, so you can't really see my hands, but um, remember the robot I built that was drawing on the ball for experimental robotics? The, the inline, the actual, or rate, uh, the radial compliance for the pen was a little permanent magnet. And then the neodymium magnets are really, really cool. They're small and very, very high forces. Um, the only thing is they're nonlinear. I think it's over one over r cubed. So just keep that in mind. But um, you know, to get the get to get uh, that much force out of a, a real a real traditional spring, I might have to use some big honking thing, whereas I could just use permanent magnet and be done with it. What's the name you mentioned? Uh, neodymium. Or ne I, I, neodymium. neodymium. Is it this? It's a material. Yeah. So uh, these these are like the gold standard for for they're called rare earth magnets now, and like China has all of the world supply of it and make it. If you go to uh, K and J, I think it's called Magnetics. They have really cheap, really nice magnets, and you can get all the way up to grade N50, which is really nice ones and all shapes and sizes. Um, okay, we can also use pneumatics as springs. So I'll talk about pneumatics for basically their normal purposes another day. But this is uh, this is a, a non-standard usage. Rob, can you zoom in, please? So what I've done is taken two pneumatic cylinders and tied the chambers together. So when I push on one, it pushes on the other. Okay, Rob, can you see? Okay. So I press one down and the other goes. It's like that, that gopher game at Chuck E. Cheese. And uh, now I can put my thumbs on it and, okay, so this is a spring. And so um, one of the ideas that I like is using pneumatics and robots not as the actual actuator, but as the transmission. Because remember, say we wanted to do a safe robot arm and we want some inline compliance. I don't have to use traditional means of compliance to do that. This could be both my cable and my spring. So, and also, I don't have to have any little cap stands or belts or redirect pulleys for the cable or belt. I can simply thread this through however I want, a very tortuous path, changing arc length, things that cables are not happy with. And then I get the transmission and I also get the compliance for free. Anyone know how to increase the stiffness in a pneumatic cylinder? Increase the pressure. So they're also nice because I can set how stiff it is. It's like the, the tires in your car, right? If they're going flat, you're losing a lot of energy. They're not very stiff. And then you start pumping up the tires and they get stiffer and stiffer and more efficient. So uh, I don't have a bike pump up here, but if I did, I could have a little knob in the middle where I can attach my bike pump and pump up the chambers and then take it off and now I have a much stiffer spring. Um, this is just another plug for Legos. Anyone seen the Lego pneumatics? They're really cool. So, this is worth recording just because. Yes, <laughs> yes, it is a little pump. Keith, you're falling asleep. Would you like to come pump this for me? Okay. So it pumps. Uh, let's see, so this one's the pump, so let's go ahead and get some... Oh. Okay. Don't over pump, please. Okay, so pneumatics, leg of pneumatics, let's get Keith's pumping action, go ahead. It comes with a little pressure gauge, both in, uh, it's got PSI at least. Okay, go ahead and quit. And now these are the little valves. So these are the little Lego pneumatic valves and I press that and hopefully one of these cylinders will move. 
Where was it? That one? Uh, this one here. This one here. Okay, ready? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now the only problem is this little pump can't hold all that much. So you're going to be getting finger block pretty soon. But, I mean, this is like 40 bucks for the whole set. Uh, this Is it this one? Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. And then let's watch the springiness. See? It's a nice spring. The reason I'm showing you this is um, for your final projects, you're going to need some way of driving a gripper. And a really standard way is to yank on a string or something. And a really nice way to yank on the string is with a pneumatic block. And you can't afford the pneumatic blocks that I showed, the real ones. These are, um, I'll at least write down the name. These are from Clippard. And they're pretty expensive. So if you want to do that for a gripper for the final project, I'm happy to have you buy some Legos, because you should all be buying them anyway. And, um, you know, it's fine. As long as that's the only Legos in your project, I'll be okay with it. Doesn't it have a lot of cost in terms of control delay? Just kind of the slowness of the robot apparently? Yeah. I hate pneumatics uh, for anything but transmission. So, powering pneumatics for robotics. Did anyone, uh, I guess it was last IROS, Bosch had this little pneumatic robot that went around. And I asked to see it, and they said, sorry, the pump broke, and plus it takes half an hour to recharge anyway. I was like, wow, that's really lame. So I've seen lots of really cool robots that aren't particularly great in practice just because like, you have to wear a giant tank on your back or it takes forever to recharge. Um, I'm not a fan, but I know lots of people are. So part transmission is something else then? Yeah, so... You don't have to recharge the yeah, you don't have to recharge the, the pneumatics when it just uses transmission. It's just a closed air circuit. I mean, eventually some will leak out, and then you just pump it up again, but it's not like a, you know, every five minutes you're pumping it up. Everyone get that? Pneumatics as a transmission don't have to be repumped. Um, and the other nice thing about pneumatics is if I were to draw my cylinder like this, and I start pushing that way, Right up until the end, this is fairly linear with distance in terms of the force deflection curve. So you can use it like roughly a linear spring until we get here. It actually looks something like that. So just stay short of the end stop and you're good. Did someone say end stop? I did. Okay. So uh, just to, real quick, the reasons why people use springs often, as I said, uh, you want to get force control with position-based motors, so you'll sense the deflection. Uh, or we'll have inline compliance for force con uh, for um, safety reasons, so we don't smush the person. Um, counterbalancing, remember I said you can have a, a, a more lightweight, compact counterbalance if you use a spring instead of uh, just a mass. Remember that issue, though, the boing wing. Um, and one of the biggest reasons is end stops. Does anyone know what an end stop is? Or can guess what it is? Stop at the end. <laughs> <laughs> that was like a contrapunt. That was some type of weird speech making device you just used on me. So an end stop, as Keith eloquently said, stops you at the end. So, um,. Say we have, uh, let's do, let's do lab three, and I'll just draw part of it. Okay. Say we didn't have a parallelogram attached to it. Say we just have just uh, a cable drive here and um, a little one off pack, haptic paddle, and we're going to drive it back and forth like this. Okay. At some point, this cable cap sand is going to run in to the elbow on either side, and that would be bad. So what we're going to do is we're going to put in stops, you know, somewhere. Actually, let's make it really severe. Say we put little rigid pins here. These are steel dowels. And so when we run into it here and when we run into it here, the robot stops. Everyone see that? Okay, so we're just restricting our rotary motion. Now. Assume this is not plywood. Assume this is a, a steel haptic paddle 
and uh, steel dowel because we really mean it. We really we want this to be a beefy haptic paddle. So what's going to happen is um, steel on steel is going to be really quite a severe impact and it's probably going to kill our bearings. So what we want is some type of compliance to um, basically get rid of that, that force spike for the momentum impulse. Um, and so that's what's called an end stop. Or I guess, okay, end stop is a general term for something that stops your robot near the end of travel, or rather it sets the end of travel. It also is sort of overloaded in that no one sells steel end stops because that's stupid. So when you say end stop, they mean something cushy. So it's an overloaded term. It means you're stopping the motion and you're also doing it in a cushy way, an elastic or compliant way so that the robot doesn't kill itself. So let me show you a few of the end stops that exist. Okay, so th these are from McMaster, and there are two main types. It's basically just a hunk of rubber with a screw on it, so I bolt it down to my table. Or conversely, it's a hunk of rubber with threads in it so that you can screw into it. These are really low quality. You got hunks of rubber hanging off every which way. I'll be damned if you can actually figure out what the stiffness of this is from the manufacturer. It's just a hunk of some type of random rubber that they've chosen. But this will do it. You could put this and that would absorb a lot of the, the shock loading. It's also called shock loading when you suddenly run into an end stop. Okay. Misumi makes a reappearance. They sell a really nice version of this. So it's threaded. And you see the flat there? Two flats? What's that for? Huh? It's for a wrench, for installing it. So how are you going to install this one? It's a pain in the butt, right? You're going to like grab onto it with pliers and rip the rubber off. Same thing here. I mean, the only way to, to tension, t tighten these things down is just to kind of hold on to it and hope it doesn't rip. Whereas with the Misumi ones, they have wrench flats specifically designed, so you're, you're actually not touching, you're just touching the housing. And then this is the super compliant, see this? Everyone see how squishy it is? Okay, and they have all types of data for force deflection curves and they'll actually calculate for you if you have a given mass at a given speed, how much of the force it's going to diminish. They have entire pages on how to use these, so they're really, really nice. And if you're interested in those, I think the part, part stub is a uh, gel MRF. And no, that's not magnetorheological fluid, it's just a coincidence. Um, so let's talk about how one might use these. <coughs> What's the danger in using an in-stop? Let's say for the moment these aren't arbitrary. Let's make this really important. I'm going to put a baby over here. Okay? <laughs> These are the little T-Rex arms. That's a, ba that's a baby with some feet. I'm going to put a baby next to my haptic device. And I want to make sure these are the giant bulgy eyes. <laughs> kind of like Mr. Burns, actually. So over here, we're going to put an in-stop just... We're going to put an in-stop over here because we just want to make sure we don't hit the cable, right? But it doesn't matter where. And here, we know where the baby is and we really don't want to hit the baby. Lawsuits will ensue. Well, the problem with these things is they're squishy. And so how do we know it's not going to squish too far? And I'm really, I'm really quite serious about this. So um, the nice thing is this is squishy. And the bad thing is, is that this is also squishy. So for protecting things that are very important, this could be electronics or, or this could be a medical robot and this actually is a baby. Um, you don't want something squishy. You want to know I never go beyond theta degrees, right? But you still want to absorb the energy. So what do you think we should do? That thing has metal at the end. So. If you squish this thing until it gets to the end, it, it will break. 
You're correct. We could just squish until we... Let me draw it up here in case anyone didn't see it. So the way this works is this is steel and steel threads and then this is the rubber. So what Shruti is saying is why don't we just compress until we hit the steel and that'll be a hard stop. And I'm telling you that's a good idea except for the fact that the manufacturer says if you squish beyond this far it breaks in half. So you want to do a, a different steel one next to it? Yeah. Yes. So what you want to do is you want to have in stops in parallel. One super squishy and then the other is an in stop. So let's make this so it breaks a little bit beyond the in stop, like the rigid one. So say this is a chunk of steel. It's not moving. Okay? This is right next to the baby and the baby will never get hurt because this is a chunk of steel and we're simply not going to deflect beyond that. Well, we're still getting this much space to slow down the robot and absorb the impact of, of the in stop. So when you use in stops, I personally, at least for medical robots, I like to use them in parallel. I call this a hard stop and I call this a soft stop. And I always design it so that the hard stop is where I want to make sure it will not get more than a few microns beyond. So it's something very stiff. And then the soft stop is um, designed so I, I won't exceed the manufacturer specifications and rip it but it'll absorb most of the energy of the impact. Everyone see that? Okay. Energy of a linear spring is what? K x squared. What's the energy of this spring? Integrate under the curve. This is the floor the force deflection curve. So the reason I'm saying this is when you look these up to the gel, gel MRF, I'm assuming they're a nonlinear curve. And you're wondering, well, hey, how do I know how much energy of my impact it will absorb? So I'm telling you, take the force deflection curve and integrate under the curve. And if you don't believe me, it's a triangle. Okay, now also something I like to do is um, I don't ever want to hit the hard stop. By the time you've hit the hard stop, things have really gone awry. And maybe your computer froze or maybe a cable snapped or something. I always like to operate in the soft stop range. Actually, I like to operate in the I never touched any of my in stops range, which is I've got an encoder and I don't want to touch this at all. That, by the time you hit the soft stop, things have gone wrong. By the time you've hit the hard stop, the robot's about to break itself and you really need to shut down and take a look at what happened. So I like to put a sensor somewhere in here. So right about here, this, this I don't know, it could be an optical switch or a touch sensor or something. It says, hey, you should, you should really pay attention to me. Now what could I wire this to that would help me out? Power. I could have some type of logic so it'll shut down my power. So in my robot what I've got is I've got each joint has a soft stop, it's got a hard stop, and then it has two pairs of sensors. It's got one that's optical and then it's got one that's magnetic. And both of those are fed into my motor amps and so it actually disables it. It's, uh, it's also fed into my computer. My software gets a flag and says hey what's going on and my motor amp automatically shuts down. That's on the microcontroller board. Uh, you no, know, it's on your actual d motor controller. But yeah, you can put it on a on a microcontroller too. So um, you know, so first you get a software flag, then your motor amp shuts down, then it hits the soft stop and fi to absorb the energy, and finally hits the hard stop to protect the baby slash robot. So so this isn't a sensor that you would ever hit under normal. Operation. Nope. And that's why it's okay to shut down the motor amp because by the time you've hit that you know things have, have gone wrong. But I like, to, I like to see this. This doesn't have to be a medical robot where you're trying to protect a patient. Robots like to break themselves. This is why the whole Terminator thing is unbelievable because a robot that survives longer than a week is like industrial grade. So um, you always want to keep your, your robot from breaking itself. By the time it hits its end stop it's really close to breaking itself. I mean the ball screws that I use for my robot could literally rip itself in half. They just really could. And so that's why I have all of this stuff. It's, it's actually not for the patient. It's, it's mainly for the robot. I have other things for the patient. Can 
mean, you're gonna hit the end stuff if you if you drop the robot. I mean, then everything is is gonna like deform and stuff. So if you have softer ones, I guess it, you might survive like a fall or something like that. But I mean, that's the idea. Mm. You have some other. It's not the motor that's moving your joint. It's something external that's moving your joint. Right? Sure. You yeah, can you can do that too. Okay, I think that's all about, well, let's talk about a few more things. Uh, has anyone heard of leaf springs? Where do I find them? <laughs> I sensed a tiny amount of derision in that, in the first word. Um, so yes, I don't know about the American part, but cars certainly, and mainly pickup trucks, you see, well, I guess the geometry of the pickup truck, you can really see them. They use these as the suspension on the back axle for a lot of pickup trucks. And so these operate what type of, is it tension, compression, torsion, et cetera, et cetera? Anyone know? Torsion. Nope. Try again. It was in the et cetera, et cetera part. Flexure. Flexure, yeah. So this is the same thing as your Belleville washer. It starts out like this and then we bend it down to like this, and there's a restoring force. That's called a leaf spring. Also, there's the Belleville washer. And let's see, I'm just gonna give you a few more. That's also called a gas spring. So a gas spring is, uh, a gas spring is basically just this, actually. Yeah, yeah it is. Hey, I figured something out. So a gas spring is basically just um, a nicely packaged form of this. And um, does anyone know why you might want a gas spring instead of, say, uh, I don't know, a not gas spring? Those are actually all really good answers. Mm -hmm. They could be lighter. You could have less fatigue. You could set the, sif the stiffness of them. But the, one of the main reasons is when they fail, it's gentle. It's not catastrophic. Typically when a gas spring fails, there's nothing that rips in half, like with a spring, and you have like shards of metal flying everywhere. Typically they'll just start losing pressure slowly, and maybe you can repump them, or you can uh, recharge them, or just replace it. But it, it's a gentle failure as opposed to a catastrophic failure. So you see those in a lot, like with medical robots, that you don't want them to just snap and cut someone in half. Any questions about springs before we move on? Yes, can you tell us more about counterbalance? Sure. Hey, I can tell you some awesome stuff about counterbalancing. It's not in my outline, but you just inspired me. Okay. So it, is, is it only constant for springs? Nope. Nope. In fact, I have a paper that uses something else. Uh, real quick, I'm just going to throw out some terms. I don't know what they mean, but look them up. <laughs> I don't know what they mean because they're functional definitions for each manufacturer. There are things called negator springs, spirator springs, some type of constant force spring, and then probably there's a cable attached. Basically, like I said, you know the, the, potenti the pot string? There are like 30 different terms for them, and I don't know why they call what what. But basically the idea is you have a constant force spring and a cable. That's about it. The way they do the constant force spring really matters. Some of them do these weird figure eight things. I'm not going to describe them to you because it'll take too long and not be particularly helpful. If you're interested, Wikipedia or um, just Google. Uh, and they're actually they're fascinating mechanisms. They'll take they'll take a spring like this, and then instead of pulling it out, Im imagine we want to pull the cable out, right? But we don't want to pull the whole spring out. So what they do is they unwind from this axle and wind backwards onto this axle in a figure eight. It's really cool. And then the, the cables around this cap stand, the cable comes out but not the spring. It's really cool. Look it up. Okay, let's talk about counterbalancing. So the really dumb way is I have a mass and I have this connected to one of my pull boxes, right? And so this is a constant force down and this is a constant force up and we're equal and opposite, right? Okay, um, what about this? What if I had, so if I pull, say I put a torsion spring on this axle, okay? If I pull on here, then it's nice and linear. Well, say I don't have something linear I want to counterbalance. Say I have something nonlinear. So what you can do 
is do it's called a spiral a spiral cap stand. Okay? And so we're gonna take a string and pull on it. And I need a different color. So this is a think of a compound gear, and now this is a compound pulley. So on one side of it we have a circular cap stand, and on the other side we have a spiral cap stand. So I could connect the circular one to a linear spring, okay? So the torque going into here, we've got torque equals uh, FR, then we've got F equals KX, so we've got KXR, R and K are constants. So we've got our torque is linear with respect to our displacement X of this linear spring, right? Everybody see that? But as I'm rotating, this distance from the tangent attachment of the string is changing. So let's draw it. If I'm right here, and this is my spring, I'm at a pretty big distance, and now, say I've rotated around, and now I'm at a small distance. Everyone see that? So as I'm turning my capstan, my lever arm is changing. And through doing some funky math, you can basically design this to give you a nonlinear counterbalance. And so what I had was I had, basically, I needed a parabolic counterbalance. And um, we got it with this. So we took a linear spring and converted its pulling force through a spiral cap stand. This is called a spiral cap stand. We turned it into a parabolic force. Uh, and if you want, I can post the paper on the website and you guys can read it. The math goes on for a while and it's kind of boring. But um, I can also give you a link. There's a guy who was a consultant for Intuitive called Gene, or if you're really looking for him, Eugene Duval, and he is a genius. He's just one of those guys that you're just like, damn, where'd you come from? He's really smart. And he has like a 180 page patent application on all this stuff. And it's just brilliant. So if you're ever interested in counterbouncing and springs, it's also something called a zero point spring that's really neat and is used a lot in counterbouncing robot arms. I'll post that tonight. Um, here. So, patent Duval. Can someone please send me an email and ask me to post Duval patent and also my, just call it the magnet paper? That goes into how to do all of this mathematically. But does everyone understand how this works? Linear spring to nonlinear counterbalance? Did that answer your question? Sorry. Part of your question? But just if you do want to do uh, just a linear compensa compensation, but not use a mass. Uh, so, I mean, you could either, it, it always comes down to some type of cable. You always have some type of cable pulling on your mass, and on the other end there's a spring pulling on it. So the question for you is, well, what type of force deflection curve do you want? If you have a mass that's moving up and down, and all you want to do is have a constant counterbalance, then you want a, a constant force spring. If you had something where you had a, a, a robot arm that was going to move down like this, and your workspace allows you to approximate gravity's sinusoid is linear over a little bit, then maybe you want a linear spring pulling on a cable. It all, and if you're doing some weird stuff like I was, maybe you want a parabolic one. It all comes down to some type of either tension or constant force spring connected to a cable connected to your mass. Right. But the, the question was more like the constant force spring seemed pretty complicated. Yes, exactly. Okay, okay, okay. Don't make them. That's, that's, that should be a take home point. They're dangerous and they're hard to use and other people sell them. This is the whole thing with like your motor controllers. You don't want to build the Copley because you could just buy the Copley and your time's a lot more valuable than the 300 bucks for the amp. So um, stock drive sells these and, uh, in a package and also um, John Evans and Sons sells these. 
Actually, <laughs> let me correct myself. This is a funny story. Um, so I bought, I called up Stock Drive and said, hey, where do your guys' constant four springs come from? The boxes, the black boxes. And they said, we can't tell you. And I said, okay. So I ordered some. And then they had a Stock Drive sticker on it. And I took an X-Acto knife and I X-Acto knifed the Stock Drive sticker on it. And underneath was a John Evans and Son sticker. <laughs> they were too lazy to take off the first sticker. So anyway, that's how I know to go here because I took off Stock Drive sticker. <laughs> Okay, anything, any other questions about springs? Okay, let's talk about the final project. My guess is that's why most of you showed up today. <laughs> um, so, I don't have all of the final, okay, let me correct myself. I have all of the final specifications for the final project. I wrote them on a piece of laser cut plywood. And that's why you can't have them yet, because they're scribbled on a piece of laser cut plywood. So tonight, I will type them up neatly and send it out, or tomorrow. But for now, this is basically what we're doing. So we're going to do a chess playing robot. So this is a chess board. We got a little robot over here. That's cool. Rob, can you come record over here, please? Just zoom in on the screen. So it's teams of three. Some of you have special circumstances. You know who you are, or maybe you don't. I'll surprise you later. And you'll be on a team of four. Um, you've got basically three weeks and some change to do it. I think it's three weeks and then to Wednesday. So three weeks and two days. There are eight teams. Three of you are doing special projects. Five of you are doing the robot arm. Um, I'm giving all of you fidgets unless some of you don't really aren't going to use them. If you're not going to use them, please don't take them because I'll give them to other teams and then they can do way cooler robots. So all the research teams, before I hand you a bag of goodies, please talk with me and make sure that you're actually going to use them. Fidgets are plug and play electronics. They're awesome. Let me spell it out for you because it's kind of weird. Um, they're Canadian, so you are kind of killing spark fun, but you know, Fidgets.com, PH. Plug and play, USB, Linux, Mac, Windows compatible. They are awesome. I'm giving you all enough to control one DC motor, one bipolar stepper, four servos, and I'm giving you four servos, one bipolar stepper, and one DC motor with an encoder. I'm also giving you a high speed encoder board capable of reading four quadrature encoders. And I'm giving you what's called the 888, which gives you eight high-resolution analog inputs, eight digital inputs, and eight digital outputs. So with all of that, it's enough to do quite an impressive robot. If you have a dish, what you should do tonight is go to Fidget's web web website and look at every single page. I'm not joking. And then figure out if there are sensors that you're dying to try. I don't have any more money in the course budget to buy them for you. But um, if you have never used ultrasound and you'd like to use ultrasound, buy yourself a sensor. It's actually pretty cheap. You have the board to read it. All of their sensors are analog, which means that the analog board, the 888, will work. They have 3D accelerometers. They have light sensors. They have sound sensors. They have ther uh, thermometers. They have uh, encoders. They have rotary pots, slide pots, ultrasound. IR distance, they have everything. It's really awesome. So the first thing tonight is go to the website, read every page, figure out if there's anything that you just think is awesome and you'd like to put in your robot just because you can, now is the time to do it. Especially those of you who are graduating, you want to build as cool of a robot as you can and try as many different things as you can in terms of sensors and actuators because this might be the last chance for a little bit. Not ever, but you know, for a few months. Um, so we're going to do chess playing. Uh, I hope all of you know what chess is. I hope some of you like chess. I like chess. And um, basically, this is what we're going to do. Each robot gets half the board and everywhere behind it. So if we were to, if we were to draw a board, okay, and we have black and white, your robot may have all the room back here, as far as you want, within reason. Please don't make it like the size of a minivan. During operation, it has to be able to access any point on this board. 
We're laser cutting these boards. I've ordered the chess pieces. They'll be here tomorrow and I'll give them to you. Basically, we're going to extend one chess square beyond so that we can take the pieces we've captured and put them off somewhere. Okay? And I'll give you the dimensions of this in the email tonight. And, um, but when it's not your turn, you have to be able to stow your arm over here so that the other robot can come on. So basically, this is going to be my arm. And it's my turn, and I come up, and you tell me where to go. I'm going to take the knight from E7 and move it somewhere else. And then I'm going to stow back. And if I capture a piece, I'm going to take it and put it off grid in a precise location. In terms of software, you're welcome to use whatever you want. Linux, Mac, Windows, just make it work. I won't accept any final projects that don't move in an intelligent fashion. So no pressing of power supplies. It has to be under closed loop control um, and doing something. It doesn't have to necessarily be like playing chess on its own. In fact, I don't expect anyone to have it actually playing chess on its own. It doesn't have to be flashy in terms of like a really nice GUI or user input. But when I, what I want is I want you to be able to say, get the piece from E7 and it will get it. Or take the piece from F2 and move to A3 and it will do it. That's a bare minimum. Fidgets are plug and play. The, I'm going to hand them out at the end of the class. I guarantee you that you can get them to work within a half an hour of plugging them in tonight. You should do so. It doesn't mean they're coded. It means they all have, um, they all have a, uh, a GUI that comes with them. So what you do, go to Fidget's website, and you download the driver. There's one driver for all OSs. You install it. You plug in your device. Your device has power and a USB cable, and then whatever it is, the actuator sensor. Plug in power, plug in your sensor actuator, plug in USB. Double click on the fidgets program, it comes up, it lists all the boards plugged in. Double click on the board, it opens up, boom, you're done. You can control this, you can read the sensor or control the actuator. For me, it literally took, someone timed me, it took 45 seconds from taking it out of the box to actually controlling it with the computer from their GUI. So, you should all do that tonight. Um, uh huh. Is fidget, like, what's the kind of an analogy to like an Arduino? Is that going to be the fidgets or is that going to be yeah. 8884? Okay. Uh, the analogy is Arduinos are awesome and I use them extensively, but it takes, it's quite a steep learning curve for some people because you have to know uh, how to use, well, we'll say, say we do uh, Atmel. So you need WinAVR and you need the Alamex thingamajigger programmer and you need to know what the registers are and how they work and they're awesome but they're also we don't have time for it. So the reason we're going with fidgets is because this is a course on mechanical design not electro mechanical design and not certainly not programming. And so robots that don't move are boring but um, programming them is difficult if you've never done it. So fidgets is the closest I can get you to just handing you the electronics and the code. So the API for it is in C, not C++. It's a little bit of a pain, but all of you should have good programmers on your team. If you don't, let me know. If you don't have a good program, let me know now, or it's going to be a very painful three weeks. Not tonight, but later in the week, I will give you starter code with a GUI in Qt. Does anyone know? Everyone, raise their hand if they know what Qt is. And now, if you've used it. Okay, so this is going to be painful for some of you. Qt is a C++ based GUI. GUIs are awesome. The whole like using printf's to debug your robot, we're not doing that. That's painful and it doesn't work well. This is an opportunity for you to learn how to do a GUI so you have a very easy, nice user interface and to debug your robot quickly. And what I mean is for the haptic device I did, um, I plotted the forces in real time and then I also had my cursor for where, where it was touching the haptic model and so I could debug it really easily and I had little sliders that could set the force. So I could slide the force to go in the X direction and then I could see my robot moving in the Y direction. I'm like, ah, man, somewhere there's a transpose that went awry. Now finding that transpose that went awry without having sliders and real-time plots would have taken 10 times as long. So you don't have to use a GUI. You don't have to use QT. But this is a great opportunity for you to learn how. And once you've made this initial investment, the rest of your time at Stanford doing research projects will go a lot quicker. OK, so let's talk about what we're actually doing. Can you record this, please? There's no camera, right? No camera. Well, you can if you want, but it's not required. So um, uh -huh. uh, can we also do the QT part of Python, or does that have to be a C++? I don't know. 
I'm not sure. Jonas might know, but I personally don't. Uh, they are. They are tough to do that. But I mean, it's just to establish that it's enough. In practice, you really don't export if you're a Mac and you use the, whatever the Mac uses. Cocoa, if you're a Mac person and you use Visual Studio and MFC thing, and if you're a Linux person and you use QC. I'm not going to get into all the reasons why I use QT because some of you will start foaming at the mouth, particularly the CS majors. Um, I've built plenty of robots and have friends who do the same, and we've all decided that QT is the best way to do it. Um, most roboticists program in C++. Yes, there are arguments for doing it in C or being really cutting edge and doing Python. On average, if you have to devote time to, develop, to developing core skill sets, that will be more transferable on average. It's going to be C++. It's going to be in QT. And there are arguments left and right of that. I'm not interested in them. The reason I'm having you do QT GUIs is, in my experience and those of people in my lab, it's the most useful and generally applicable. So let's show the robot arm. This is 50 bucks at Jameco. It acts like it was 50 bucks. But this is basically the idea. Where did you buy this? Jameco. OK. And can you see? OK, cool. So let's. Make sure we're in the workspace. So this is basically what you're building, only doing a much better job. So you have to be able to grip the piece, raise it off the board, oh god, and then let it down and then get off of the board, okay? That's what you're doing. Uh, and it will be awesome and glorious. A little faster. A little faster. <laughs> so I don't care how you do it as long as you stay within the rules. And let me tell you now, for those of you who've done 218, is anyone a still a remnant of the leaf blower years? Does anyone know what I mean when I put 218 and leaf blower in the same sentence? No tricks, no gimmicks. You may not find the one hole or the nth hole in my project specifications and use it. If I think what you're doing is lame and cheating and not actually teaching you anything, I want to see you sweat and do it the hard way because that's how you learn. And I mean that in a nice way. I don't mean like a, this is painful. I mean like you're building a robot and it should challenge you because otherwise there's no reason for you to be doing this, right? So if I see you doing something that's lame, I'm going to immediately ban it on the fly. So just keep that in mind. There are no quick ways out of this project. There are no tricks or gimmicks. Lameness will be banned automatically. So let's talk about how we could do this. My arm wants to grip this marker, okay? So what I want you all to do by Thursday morning is figure out the kinematics for how your robot arm is going to get the, the marker. And again, I'll give you all the specific rules you need later, but just think about if you had a robot arm, what's the best way to do it? So, remember, we have to stay within half the board. So anyone who wants to put linear gantries this way, so that we slide back and forth, x, y, you can't do linear gantries because that takes up more than half the board. Now you could do something where you put your linear gantries back here, and you're offset and you come back. But I'll just go ahead and give you guys the, the conclusion you'll come to later anyway. Doing all linear for this will be very painful and very expensive. You're welcome to do it if you've got the cash. Actually, if you've really got the cash, it'll be really easy. You just bolt some XYZs together and you're done. And I'm happy for you all to do that. Just make sure you have the cash to do it. Doing linear systems with that, with, on, on a budget is really painful. So you're probably going to want some type of revolute arm. Okay. Now. I could do this just to access the different squares in the checkerboard, right? So all I need is one, two, and assume I don't care about alpha. Maybe you care about it, maybe you don't. It's up to you guys. Now I need some way of getting down to the marker, right? Because I need clearance. So you can either rotate down and grab it, or you can go down prismatically. So you can just go straight down. So the standard Scara robot is two rotations in plane. <clears throat> I meant to do that. Two rotations in plane, and then one linear down. I haven't given you the linear lecture, but you all did rack and pinion in lab one, right? 
All in your stuff is some form of rack and pinion, with the exception of screws, and I'll be lecturing on that pretty soon, but just abstract it. Just think of linear motion. If you tell me I'm doing linear motion, I'll say fine, I know what that is. You don't have to know how to use ball screws or lead screws to do linear motion. For, for the time being, just consider rack and pinion, okay? So we could either do two revolute and then rack and pinion and then some type of gripper, uh, or why don't we flip it up like this, okay? And now I'll have a base that moves me like this and an elbow and some type of wrist and a gripper. Now if you do it this way, what's the problem with this? Uh, no, I can, I can come above the pieces. If you're not careful, you're going to have to counterbalance it. Keep in mind, you can either have gravity opposing you or being irrelevant. Yeah, it's up to you guys. I'm happy to have you counterbalance things. Or have them such that gravity matters, but you have such a big gear head it actually doesn't matter. But just keep in mind, you want to think about whether or not you need to counterbalance it. Okay? Uh, instead of doing prismatic down to get the piece, we could just rotate down. Right? You've got servos, and it's, these are really lightweight little pieces, so you could have revolute, 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 and gripper. Okay? I don't care if, can you zoom in on the piece, Rob? I don't care in terms of pose if you come from directly above and grip it, or if you come in from the side and grip and rotate, or if you pull straight up. I mean, you could do some type of weird corkscrew where you like grab it while rotating up. That'd actually be pretty cool. <laughs> I don't care as long as you don't knock over the adjacent pieces. So think about what's the easiest way, what's the most interesting way. Um, for me, as long as it works and looks nice and works well, I'm happy. So crazy corkscrews, rotating down. In terms of grippers, I don't need anything fancy. I also don't care if there's backlash in the gripper. Everything else should be nice. I don't want... I, this shouldn't be a project you could have done before taking the course and you're going to hacksaw things together. It should be things you've learned from this course to do things the right way. As such, there will be some requirements. You have to use at least one DC motor, at least one stepper, at least one servo. There has to be at least one cable transmission, a la Lab 3. Now, belts are up to you guys. The main thing with that is you have to order the belt, and that takes time. So if you want to do belts, you need to get ordering like this week but at least one cable transmission. Um, but for the gripper, you know, something that just kind of pulls the string and pulls two things together like this is fine. It doesn't have to be a parallelogram. We're not modifying the pieces, so don't, don't super glue magnets on it and then have an electromagnetic coil. That doesn't work. No Velcro, no tape, no super glue, either in the robot or for picking things up. Can we put QR tags on top of them so that we can recognize who they are? Sure. The cooler you want to make it, the happier I am. This is for your guys' own edification. Uh huh. Just to clarify, we are building that whole thing, right? The arm? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm hmm. For plywood and then, yeah, right? I mean. Oh, yeah. Okay. So the laser can't. Any variation of that? Huh? Yeah, any variation of that. So um, I will give you the experience of 218 that I had and every ro robot since. Simpler is better. If you shoot for the moon, you're not going to make it. So think about what's the simplest way of doing this possible, and then do a super good job. I will be extremely unimpressed and disappointed if you try to give me a sevened off, you know, uh, redundant robot, and it doesn't work. I'm interested in things working, and the simpler you can do, the better. That means that you're really smart at this. So try to minimize number of degrees of freedom. Try to minimize mechanical complexity. Remember, you do have to use a stepper and a DC motor and a cable transmission. So you can't just, you know, bolt a bunch of servos together. That's lame. But don't go out of your way to make it complicated. It will be complicated on its own by the end, just believe me. Get started in parallel with the code and the electronics. There are three threads here. Code, electronics, and hardware. You should be doing all of them as of tonight, in terms, well, within reason. As in, don't build everything and be like, okay, I'll do the code later. It won't work. You want one team member working on, uh, on one of those at all times. You should have your motors running in the computer, hopefully tonight. By the end of the week, maybe you'll have a very simple, whenever I send out the starter code, a very simple C++ program that just moves one motor. And there will, be, there will be sort of waypoints along the way in terms of I want to see um, some type of code where you enter command and a motor spins. Another one will be your motor just spins at all. 
Um, other ones will be, I want to see all your SOLIDWORKS. Another one will be, I want to see some stuff assembled. You'll be using our, la oh, you'll be sending us files and we'll be laser cutting. Now this isn't like a, where you send us a file and I give you a part. You have to physically come in with the parts that mate with it because something is going to be screwed up on average and we're going to have to modify the file right then and there to get you your part. Um, mm -hmm. So what parts will you, will you have available for us like in terms of screws, dowels? Uh, if you want screws, you can either order them yourself or tell me and I'll order them. And you know, they come overnight from McMaster. So always stay one night ahead. I'll give you 8mm shafts. I'll give you uh, unflanged 8mm bearings. I bought out all VXB's flange bearings, so sorry. Um, no MDF, just because the filtration system can't handle it right now. So it's quarter inch plywood and a little bit of Delrin for things like the cable cap stand nut that you need. Anything that has to be really like solidly tapped, we can do little bits of Delrin. Mainly quarter inch plywood, and you could do everything out of quarter inch plywood. Hey? Yeah, the stuff from Lab 3. What thickness of Delrin is there? Just quarter inch. Yeah. Now, in terms of borrowing things from, from the homeworks, I am more than happy for you to literally cut and paste Lab 3 or Lab 2 or Lab 1 into your final project. Again, you don't get any extra points for making this harder than it needs to be. If I were you, in your position, I'd be like, holy crap, I need one cable transmission, and I just did one, yoink, and I'd put it in the air. The idea is for you to have a second chance and more practice, and this time I'm not holding your hand to do it. Um, so feel free to take whatever you want, as long as it's your guy's CAD. It can't be my master CAD or anything else. As long as it's your CAD that you CADed, feel free to put it in your final project. The goal with this is for you to get started as soon as possible and then screw something up as soon as possible so that you can get on to succeeding. The way it goes in mechanical design is you design, 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 laser cut, can you please turn that off, Rob? Uh, and then the first time you laser cut it, it's like, wow, that sucked. And then you redo it, and then it doesn't suck. Uh huh. Well, we have design reviews and things like that. Yes. And I'll, I'll email out about that later. <laughs> Other questions? So can we cut several times? Yeah. You can cut as much as Rob and me can stand. <laughs> 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 I'm letting you all know I'm on new office hours as of tonight, so I won't be in at any nights anymore, uh, except for the final night. Um, if you want to get me, morning or afternoon will be good, and Rob will probably be taking night shifts at some point, not late nights. We, we got you through the labs, and that was uh, congratulations to you and congratulations to us, because it almost killed us, all of us. So now we're going to calm down a little bit, at least Rob and me, and um, not have quite as many office hours, and especially not as late. I'll be in mornings and afternoons, Rob will be in somewhat uh, during early evenings. But don't wait until the last minute and be like, hey, I need something, because odds are we can't do it if you wait to the last minute. I'm really serious. I'm happy to help you all day, every day until like 8 o'clock at night, as long as you come to me ahead of time. But I can't help anyone if you wait until the last minute. So again, if you get started, the sooner you get started, the sooner you can screw up the first round of CAD and laser cutting, the sooner you can have the second round actually work. And I'm not being glib about this. Every time I design something and laser cut it, it never works on the first try, ever. Lab three, I had to do two rounds. Lab two, I had to do two rounds. Lab one, I had to do two rounds. So, you know, I've been doing this for years and I still always have at least one iteration on the initial design. Any other questions? So low gears and 3D printing? Uh, if they're small and not frequent, then yes, we could 3D print some gears. What's the maximum Can we 3D print with kind of like flexible? The answer is you can't print anything if you're wondering what the maximum size is. <laughs> I just said small. <laughs> so, uh, small means on, on the order of the lab one size gears. We have uh, parts to cut. Do you want us to email you and set up a time to come in or just come in? Uh, email me. Uh, email me and Rob. CC me and Rob on all of it. Even if you only want to talk to Rob, CC me. Even if you only want to talk to me, CC Rob. Um, and uh, popping by usually isn't good because we're often in the middle of something else. And, um, but uh, I check my email ridiculously often, so I'll get back to you quickly.
Other questions? And you're all free to go. I mean, we're 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 still talking as long as you want to be here, but class is over. Are you handing out something today? Oh, yeah. Sorry. Okay. And I have a sheet with names on it. Thank you. Sorry about that. <coughs> David Cummings. These are expensive. This is several hundred dollars of parts each. I think it might be like four or five hundred dollars worth of parts. I get them back at the end of the quarter. Please don't break them. I, I literally do not have the money to replace them. Don't lose them either. Don't share them with other teams. If dude or dudette from group B breaks group A's thing, group A is screwed. Robert Romano. And I'm just taking the first person of the team on my list. Jonathan Hofius. Also, you want the kitchen boards back at the end of the day. I want all motors and boards that I handed out to you back at the end of the quarter. Shruti Gupta. Yeah. Yeah. Eight millimeter shafts everywhere, people. This is not only because that's what I'm buying, this is also because you're still a little bit new to bearings, and I think you're going to find smaller bearings will get destroyed very quickly. Rohan Kamath. Michelle and Fidel and Kirk, do you guys want any fidgets? I've got them if you want them. Yep. If you end up not using them, just bring them back. Okay. Samir, Gerald, and Chris, do you think you're going to use fidgets? Uh, yes. Unless it actually in. Here's the rule. If the board slash motor doesn't end up in your final robot for the class, I would like it back beforehand. So, if you want to screw around with them but not have them in the robot, don't do that. Uh, Alex G, Zan Quek, and Jiang Ye. Are you guys using fidgets? Okay. Is there anyone whose name didn't get called in terms of their group? Nope. Okay. Hey guys, one last thing. How about figure out if you want to use these fidgets by Wednesday? If you're doing not the robot arm and uh, you decide you do want to use them, awesome, let me know and they're yours. If you decide actually we're not using them, let me know and then I'll take them and give them to another team. My team. Class dismissed. Right, quit, right?